Okay, I am going to call this meeting to order. It's just a little after uh, seven. And we have a couple announcements that we wanted to make before we introduce our guest speaker tonight. Um, the first is that we have printed up um, stickers, member stickers um, that are suitable for your boat or your car. Um, and there was a notice um, that you could contact the treasurer at CAPCA um, to get uh, additional stickers or to get um, stickers if you would like them. We also have rack cards, new ones that we just printed up. And if any of you um, think that they would be suitable for a marina um, or another maritime business um, that you would like to um, distribute some at, um, again, you can get copies of both rack cards and stickers um, by contacting treasurer at capca.net. Second thing I would um, like to announce is that it's time for us to put together a slate for our board election in November. We were just talking about our membership um, meeting. And we have some vacancies um, on the board um, in the coming year and would love to encourage um, any of you who would be interested in serving on the board. There are some specialized um, roles um, available, um, such as communications and programs and others. And so I would um, ask you to contact me at president um, at capca.net um, to um, let me know of your interest. I'd be happy to talk to you, um, explain uh, what we have available, and we'd love to have some new people who would volunteer um, to help us. As you know, we are an all-volunteer uh, organization so that all of our programming um, is done by our um, volunteers. And so if you um, are enjoying some of the member benefits and would like to pitch in, we would love to have you. So please um, feel free to email me your interest and we can have a conversation very soon. Um, the last um, announcement um, I will call on Alan, um, who is our continuing education director, to let us know about some of the classes that are coming up this uh, fall. Alan? Vicki, uh, the, the first thing we have coming up um, is a, uh, a webinar at our next meeting. Uh, it's being presented by Phil Mitchell, who's the uh, proprietor of Electronic Marines, uh, Electronic Marine in Annapolis. Uh, and he's going to be doing a program on the latest advancement in shipboard no navigation. Um, he'll be fresh coming from the uh, Annapolis uh, Power and Sailboat Show. And he covers uh, his company, covers every brand of every product you could possibly think of. And uh, so he's going to give an overview of all the new stuff that's coming out and it's being introduced at the uh, at the boat show. So I strongly recommend that's on October 23rd. That's our standard October meeting. Uh, hope everybody will sign in and uh, join in on that presentation. Uh, November is pretty full for us. We've got on November 4th, our CPR and first aid for boaters course. That's the uh, uh, presentation Pan American Heart Association class that we do twice a year. Uh, so everybody that needs to have their uh, certifications renewed, which and I again want to remind everybody that if you're holding a license, you have to have a current license, uh, current CPR first aid card. And this class obviously meets those um, requirements. On November 11th, uh, Sam Linus, uh, Dr. Sam Linus is going to do his presentation on medical emergencies at sea beyond first aid. It takes what we do uh, in our standard first aid course to another level. And it's always been a very popular class. So I uh, strongly recommend that anybody wants to uh, sit in and learn a little bit more about first aid, take that one. And then on November 18th, electronic charting and voyage planning uh, and with a simulator. And this is, uh, how do I put it, the electronic uh, charting at the captain's level, not uh, how to do a uh, get from point A to point B and lat lawns, but everything that uh, way beyond that. Uh, 
class. So I, uh, again, that's the third class that we're going to be having in November. Information on all of our classes is available on our website. So get a chance, take a look at uh, what we have available. Look forward to seeing everybody at one of the classes coming up. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Alan. And so we usually, um, prior to starting this meeting, have you all um, let us know in the chat room where you are calling in from. It um, is always interesting to us um, to see um, people's locations um, and to see if we are in fact reaching um, people with these Zoom um, meetings that we otherwise wouldn't reach um, if they were being held in um, Annapolis. And so we um, have a guest speaker tonight, um, Captain Mike Dodd, who is a lifelong voter. Um, and six years ago, he purchased a Hatteras 61 cockpit motor yacht and did a tour of the bay with his wife and wrote a book, Chesapeake Odyssey, 23 Ports of Call with Historic Perspectives. And so tonight he's going to share those historic perspectives with us, some facts, some tidbits um, on his journey. And Davis, um, you are going to um, monitor the chat and conduct the Q&A, is that correct? That's correct. If you will, uh, as they come up, type your questions in the chat. I'll moderate them, uh, the Q&A at the end of his presentation. Okay, Mike, we're going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Well, uh, thank you all for having me. Does everybody have a full screen? No. You haven't shared it yet, I don't think, Michael. Uh, okay, I had share screen at the bottom. Yeah. And have you hit the record button, uh, Dave? Yes, we've been recording. For some reason, it's not showing up. Not sure what's going on. Uh, let me hit share over here. Is that better? There we go. There you go. There you go. You got it. Okay, great. And it's good here. Yeah. And the the up and downs are not working. Try the left and right arrow. Left. Try the left and right. There we go. We got yeah. it. Okay, good. Okay, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you about my book. Uh, as uh, Vicki said in the introduction, uh, I took a tour. I've, many of us have taken tours of the Bay, obviously, but we did a fairly consistent tour, and I decided we had so much fun that I wanted to write down some of our experiences. So this is originally set up to be a cruising guide for people that are not so experienced or people who may not live around the Bay. But I'm a kind of a history guy, and I decided to put a lot of history in the book. So the first uh, part of each chapter talks about the history of some of the places we visited. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. We actually did it during the COVID summer in 2020 and had no problems. Nobody, none of us got sick. And uh, the, the nice thing about it was that the, um, the marinas were not crowded, nor were the restaurants. So it worked out pretty well for us. So this is the front cover of the book. And if anybody's interested, this is available on Amazon. Uh, the inside cover has the red, these red towns here are the ports we visited in Maryland. That's on the inside cover of the book. And on the back inside cover of the book are the ports that we visited in Virginia. So that gives you kind of a basic uh, outline of where we visited. I tried to format the, cat, the chapter so that the beginning is starts with the history, then things that you observe to these communities when you come in by water overnight accommodations, sites to see, places to eat. And some of the towns have particular points of interest. And um, so I tried to outline those. So we started in Baltimore, went south on the Western shore, went up the Pot uh, Potomac River, continued down to Norfolk, then crossed over to Cape Charles and went up north on the uh, Eastern shore, as far up as Haverty Grace and headed back to Baltimore. So we completed a loop. Um, there's lots of things to talk about in each of these towns and probably in my opinion, the most interesting is Baltimore because so much historic, uh, so many historic things have taken place in Baltimore and a lot of it surrounded the War of 1812. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And um, of course, you all, this is the, uh, one of the shots of downtown Harbor. Uh, it was established, the city was established in 1706 by the General Assembly 
and named for the Irish barony of Baltimore. Uh, I've visited Baltimore and Ireland, by the way, it's a small town, a small port town, but I think in that era, it was quite a big, important uh, port. Uh, there are lots of things to see in Baltimore. One of the big ones is Fort McHenry, and I'm sure you all have visited there. It's a fascinating tour they have. They have a great video, and you'll learn a lot of things there that you may not have known before. Uh, the fort is named after Dr. James McHenry, who was an aide to Washington during the American Revolution. Um, I, there's no way for me to ask questions. I, every, I have a couple of quiz questions, but I, I don't think it's not a, there's no easy way to do that with this group as it is. But uh, a lot of people, everybody knows that Francis Scott Key observed the bombardment of Fort McHenry, but uh, no one ever seems to inquire as to why he was there and where he exactly was when he observed this. And he was on a British prison ship. Probably some of you know that, but, and you say, what was he doing on a British prison ship? Well, he was there to negotiate the release of a friend of his, Dr. William Beans, who had been captured by the British when they, after they finished burning Washington, DC, Dr. Beans lived in Upper Marlboro and the British decided to arrest him because they felt he wasn't taking proper care of the British injured. So he was on a prison ship. Key was friends with him, learned about it and got permission from President Madison <laughs> to visit the prison ship and negotiate his release. And the British ended up releasing him without any problems, but Key and Dr. Beans were on the ship and they overheard the plans to bombard Baltimore. So they held them on the ship for several days until after the bombardment was over and then they released them. So Key happened to be there the next morning after the bombardment. And by the way, the bombardment took 24 hours. They estimated there were 1500 shells thrown at the Fort McHenry and it somehow survived. So, um, that's how he was there, and that's what spawned the Star Spangled Banner. So I think it's kind of an interesting background. Key was from, he was local, by the way, and in fact, he attended college at St. John's College in Annapolis. And there's an auditorium there named after him, the Key Auditorium. The other interesting fact I think about the uh, Fort McHenry story is that the British, when they attacked the city, they would usually send troops by land and bombard by sea. So almost always a two-pronged attack, and that applied to Baltimore as well. So what the British did was they landed about 5,000 troops on North Point, which is the uh, eastern edge of the Patapsco River, and uh, they marched up toward Baltimore to attack the eastern side of the city. And the leader of that group was a fa very famous general named Robert Ross, who had earned a great reputation and fighting against Napoleon in Europe. And he was probably one of the most prominent and well-known generals in the British army. He was akin to our General MacArthur. Anyway, he was marching up behind his troops toward the eastern side of Baltimore. And there were two teenagers in a, in a tree with squirrel guns and he happened to just ride right under the tree and the teenagers shot and killed General Ross. It was a huge loss for the British. Unfortunately, the teenagers were immediately shot and um, their names were McComas and Wells. And to this day, there's a monument downtown in Baltimore, a small 15 foot pyramid to their honor. So it's also, I, I think a very interesting uh, bit of history that you don't hear about too often. Now, you all probably have been on this uh, ship. It was the, uh, it sank the last <clears throat> Japanese ship in World War II. And of course you can get on this. It's very interesting uh, to tour it. And this is the torpedo area in the bow of the ship. Uh, so it's open, I think pretty much daily. And it's, if you haven't been on it, I recommend it. It's quite interesting. The USS Constellation, of course, is a, always in Baltimore tied up there and it's fascinating to visit that. There was a Glen L. Martin company. Some of you may be acquainted with that. It was an aircraft builder on Middle River in Baltimore, and they built lots of airplanes of all types, seaplanes and land planes and bombers and attack planes for World War II. And after the war was over, they were contracted by the Navy to build a jet seaplane. And this is the first jet seaplane ever built. 
they built about 15 of these things. And this is a photograph of one of their early tests. It took off out of Middle River. And when I was a youngster, my father and brother and I were fishing out in the Middle River and this thing decided to take off. And it, was, it looked exactly like this. And it was just a fascinating experience to watch this thing. It, it seemed like it, it must have gone a mile before it got out of the water. And the noise of those four engines was just intolerable. So it was quite fascinating. And I have never forgotten it. And the, you know, they stopped making these because the Navy, well, they canceled the contract because they developed other plans. You all may have been on the Liberty ship, John Brown. Yesterday, by the way, they, they go out twice a year and take uh, guests out down to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and back. It's about a four or five hour trip. And um, they did it yesterday, uh, the 17th of September. And it's fascinating, especially for people who are not experienced with boats and ships, because they let you wander anywhere on the ship. You could go down in the engine room while it's underway. They have actors posing as General MacArthur, President Roosevelt. They have singers singing music from the 40s. They serve lunch on board. It's really a, a fascinating experience. They do this twice a year. When I did it a couple of years ago, they had somehow obtained a, uh, they, oh, when you get to the Bay Bridge, they have vintage airplanes from World War II that fly over the boat. And a couple of years ago, they had a vintage Japanese Zero. I don't know where they found that, probably from one of the movies, but this guy was flying this thing around and he would, he would come down low in the water and come right at the ship like he was gonna attack the ship. And they loaded up their 20 millimeter Orlikon machine guns and were shooting blanks at him. It was really quite fascinating. So they, it's, if you haven't done it, I think it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, we then headed, our next port of call was Annapolis. And of course, most of us are acquainted with uh, dockage and places to visit in Annapolis. But there's a lot of history there. The four signers of Maryland, the four signers from Maryland who signed the Declaration of Independence were all from Annapolis. And their homes all still exist and are pretty much intact. Um, we'll go through their, their homes in just a minute. Uh, Annapolis is famous also because Lafayette brought American troops there and gathered them on the way to uh, Yorktown to assist Washington in his uh, fight at Yorktown. And they, they, they uh, camped uh, on the south side of Spa Creek for a couple of days. The Maryland State House is very famous. Washington resigned his commission as commander of the army on December 23rd, 1783. Uh, much to the surprise of many Americans, they actually thought he was gonna be the king, but he wanted no parts of it and he wisely retired to his farm like the ancient Roman Cincinnatus. Of course, the Naval Academy was established in 1845. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln made one visit to Annapolis on February 2, 1865. He got on a ship and went down to Norfolk to try to negotiate with some Confederates to end the war, but it was not successful. And of course, we all know Middleton Tavern, very famous, and that was a hangout for our founding fathers. Now, this is one of the signers of the declaration, Samuel Chase, and this is his home on Maryland Avenue. It's now a retirement home for, uh, I think, women from the Presbyterian Church, so it's not open to the public. They may open it once a year around Christmas, but it's not generally open. Quite a nice mansion. Thomas Stone was another signer. This is the only house left of the four signers, which is in private hands, so this is not open to the public. The William Paca House, of course, is very famous. <clears throat> um, it's a beautiful place. This used to be a hotel called Carvel Hall. And when they left, they were gonna knock this building down and that's what got the Annapolis Historic Society together. And they prevented this uh, from being knocked down. That would have been a terrible loss. And finally, the Charles Carroll House uh, on St. Mary's uh, Church campus. So the, these, this and the others uh, are open to the public. So take a house and this is open to the public. What's interesting I think is that all of these homes are number one, all brick and number two, they're enormous. So these individuals who signed their life and honor away on the declaration were very wealthy members of the aristocracy. Uh, not a typical group to be starting a revolution with the British aristocracy, kind of an interesting fact. 
Uh, Maryland State House, of course, uh, in the State House in the old Senate chamber is a statue of George Washington resigning his commission. Uh, this is a plaque on West Street that uh, denotes where Lincoln got off of the train. And that era, there was a train that came directly from Washington to Annapolis. And he secretly left Washington only with a bodyguard and an aide and came to Annapolis. They walked down past uh, St. John's College, down to the waterfront and got on the boat and headed down to Norfolk. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. <clears throat> and here, of course, is Middleton Tavern at the foot of Ego Alley. Next, we headed south to uh, Solomon's. Um, Solomon's, of course, is a small boating community, but there are a couple of things that happened of interest there. One was the Battle of St. Leonard's Creek. Commodore Joshua Barney engaged in the largest naval engagement in Maryland history. He was trying to stop the British frigates from making their way up the Patuxent River to attack Washington, D.C. He held them up for a couple of days, but he was, of course, not successful. And they sailed north to a tiny town in Charles County called Benedict. And there about 5,000 troops unloaded, marched through Marlboro and Bladensburg and burned the capital. Uh, in World War II, Solomons was a site for training amphibious landings. And some of those uh, Navy men left Solomons and went to the Solomons Islands in South Pacific. And of course the famous Calvert Marine Museum is a lovely spot full of interesting things. Excuse me. This is a picture, a drawing of uh, Joshua Barney. He didn't have the manpower or the ships to stop the British. It was, it was just a losing battle. Calvert Marine Museum at Solomon's. Excuse me. And this, this is a map that's scattered around the state. There's one at Solomon's, there's one at St. Michael's. I think there's one in Baltimore. And it shows the course of the British during the War of 1812. They would leave from this little point down here and one group went up the Potomac to Washington. Another group went up the uh, Patuxent River and unloaded and marched in and burned Washington. And this line denotes the group that went up to Baltimore to try and burn Baltimore. This group went up Avery Grace and here to Frederick. And the question is, what's, what's the common denominator in this little point down here? I don't think anybody can make out this name here, but this is Tangier Island, little Tangier Island in Virginia. And it turns out that the British built a substantial fort on Tangier Island, and that was their supply depot. So they would supp send supplies from England, unload them here, and the ships coursing through the bay would come here, pick up their gunpowder supplies and cannonballs, and go out and make terror around the Chesapeake Bay. We visited Tanger Island on our trip and were unable to find any sign of the fort. The fort was called Fort Albion and there are no remnants of it at all, not even a piling in the water. So from Solomon's, we continued toward Washington DC and up the Potomac. <clears throat> the, um, there's not a lot of good marinas on the Potomac. There are a couple of places you can stop. One is Tall Timbers in Southern, it's, these are all on the North side, on the Maryland side. The other is Cobb Island. And the third interesting place is St. Clement's Island. Tall Timbers has a, an, it's a small creek, Herring Creek, with a nice restaurant there. When we were visiting during COVID, the restaurant, unfortunately, was closed. Um, so it's kind of a cute little marina. We met the owner, very friendly guy. Cobb Island is known for being the first site where intelligent speech was transmitted by, by electromagnetic waves in 1900. I don't know why they chose <clears throat> that place to do it, because there's not much on Cobb Island. There wasn't then and there's not much now. <clears throat> um, St. Clements, uh, one, uh, one thing about the uh, Tall Timbers, I'm sure many of you are acquainted with the fact that there's a World War II U-boat buried in the Potomac River. And it's about two miles directly south of Herring Creek. And it's now designated as a Maryland historic site. And they, from April to December, they place a buoy there for divers and they allow divers to go down and investigate the submarine. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. And I've seen videos of the visits down there. And it's a, it's a 240 foot submarine, it's a large submarine. And it was not there 
going to Washington to shoot, shoot torpedoes, but it was captured at the end of the war by the British. They carefully examined it and gave it to the US Navy. The Navy examined it for a while and then they decided to dump it in the middle of the Potomac River. So they suck it there, I think in 1948, and it's been sitting there since. One of the interesting things about that U-boat, it's called U-1105. It was a later built U-boat and it was a very sophisticated one. And they covered it with, with rubber to reduce the ability for sonar to detect it. So they made 10 of these submarines and they were essentially invisible. Fortunately, they didn't launch them till June of 1944 and the war was uh, ended in uh, May of 1945, but they were extremely sophisticated submarines for that era. Saints Clement Island, uh, Clements Island was the site of the first European colony in Maryland, uh, March 25th, 1634, now Maryland Day. That's where Leonard Calvert landed on the Ark of the Dove. You cannot go there by dock, unfortunately. There is no dock there. You have to go by land and take a little boat out to the island. This is the uh, tall timbers at Herring Creek, Cobb Island, the milestone. They have a nice sign there in front of the house. And there's a 40 foot cross dedicated to Lord Calvert on St. Clement's Island. Potomac River is full of history. John Wilkes Booth and his colleague, David Herridge left from Pope's Creek and attempted to cross the Potomac to get to Virginia after, they, after Booth assassinated Lincoln. They did make it with some trouble to Virginia, but things did not end well for him. And of course, uh, you may have heard of the ghost fleet at Mallows Bay, and we all know about Mount Vernon, Fort Washington, I'll talk about in just a minute, and National Harbor are things to see on the way to, uh, to Washington. Uh, we talked about Booth. Mallows Bay is the, uh, there's what they call a ghost fleet. Most of these are wooden ships left over from World War I. They overbuilt the number of ships they needed, so they didn't know what to do with them, and they just docked, they anchored them here and left them, and they disintegrated over all the years so that there's not much left except the perimeter of the hulls, the configuration of the hulls. Uh, the best way to see the ghost fleet, if you're interested, is by kayak. This one ship is the only steel ship, and this was an old ferry boat. Uh, that's the only steel ship in Mallows Bay. So you'll sometimes hear the term, the ghost fleet of Mallows Bay. This is Washington's house in Mount Vernon. There is a dock on the Potomac that allows pleasure boats to tie up, but you need to call and get permission before you tie up. This is Washington's tomb at Mount Vernon. They did bury him in his home, which was nice. This is Fort Washington. This is a little bit south of DC. You can see the Woodrow Wilson Bridge right here. You never hear much about this fort. It's actually a huge fort. It's bigger than Fort McHenry. There's the parade ground. And it's, they had dozens of cannons pointing in all directions. So it was built to protect DC in the era, uh, 1812 era. Unfortunately, it was manned by a Colonel Dyson, who when the British came up to uh, attack Washington on the Potomac side, he, he got frightened and abandoned the fort. They had ammunition, men, supplies, cannonballs. And this is the narrowest point at south of Washington. It's about 300 yards across here and the cannon embankments were here, they could have slaughtered the British, but uh, he was later court-martialed. Then there's a the National Harbor Center, of course, with lots of things and, uh, to see there. The huge Ferris wheel is interesting. When we went to Washington, we were able to stay at the Capitol Yacht Club, and it's right in the center of all the action. There are too many things to talk about in a, in a slideshow in Washington. There's a whole chapter in my book about it, but uh, we stayed there for about three days. Now heading south, we came down on the Virginia side and stopped at Colonial Beach. This was a famous resort for Washingtonians before the Bay Bridge was built in 1952. Once that bridge was built, everybody was attracted to drive over it and go to the Eastern shore. So a lot of these resorts along the river just withered up. This is a photograph of Alexander Graham Bell's summer home in Colonial Beach. We then went south 
the Reedville. I don't know if you've been there before. There's not much there today, but at one point in the 1880s, this was a huge place for catching Manhattan, which was required for oil lamps. And there was a period in that era when this was said to be the wealthiest community in the United States. <clears throat> today, they still fish Manhattan, these enormous blue hulled ships. And the Omega protein factory is seen here in this um, photograph at night. It's all lit up. We stayed across the creek in a little marina, but I was not aware that this place stayed open 24 hours a day. <laughs> so it was well lit up all night and a little bit noisy. As you head south to the uh, Rappahannock, you have to visit Irvington, Virginia, famous for the Tides Inn Resort, beautiful place, golf course, beach, several restaurants, lovely resort to stay at. Continuing south, we went to Yorktown. The most famous thing about Yorktown is, is the site where of the last major battle of the American Revolution where Cornwallis surrendered to Washington. And of course, it's near Jamestown and Williamsburg, which are sort of center of all American history. A lot of history started there. So it's we stayed there for about three days and just, you know, tried did as much touring as we could. It's fascinating, lots of history to see. We then proceeded to Hampton, Virginia, the home of Fort, Mon uh, Fort Monroe. Confederate President Jefferson Davis was imprisoned there after the Civil War, awaiting a trial, which he never ended up being put on trial. And he was, they were thinking they were gonna hang him, but he was later released. And um, it's also, of course, the uh, Hampton Roads is the site of the first ironclad sea battle in 1862. And this is a photograph of the Norfolk Naval Yard you can take land tours of the Naval Yard, and I would recommend it. It's absolutely fascinating. We then crossed the Southern Bay at Cape Charles and visited that interesting community and a community slightly north called on Nancock. Uh, Cape Charles may have been the first planned community in the United States. And they actually had train service that came to Cape Charles. And you could get on a train in New York City and the next day be in St. Charles. This is in the 1880s, 1890s, pretty amazing. Still, and now it's more of a resort with golf courses and beaches and so forth. Uh, Onancac is a charming little village uh, on the river and uh, there's not a lot of history there, but there's some good places to eat. It dates back to 1680. The last sea battle of the American Revolution occurred there in 1782. Chrisfield was next. We stayed there for a couple of days and took the mail boat to Tangier Island and the next day to Smith Island. If anybody hasn't been to those two islands, I'd recommend it. It's interesting, fascinating people there. They have a, their, their ancestors came from Cornwall, England, and they still have a little bit of a strange accent, especially when they speak to each other. Uh, when they speak to foreigners like us, they, they don't sound like there's much of an accent, but it's interesting to hear them speak to each other. Uh, Crisfield was named after John Crisfield, a local attorney and railroad man who was a member of Congress, friends with Abe Lincoln. And he, put, he sort of put Crisfield on the map with a, uh, as a seafood uh, center with oysters first and then crabs. And there's a rail line that also goes to Crisfield to ship out the oysters and crabs. There's the mail boat. It's about an hour to get to from Crisfield to Tangier Island. Tangier had a cholera epidemic in 1886, which killed a huge percentage of people on the island. And the ones that survived left the island. As of 2020, August, the COVID uh, pandemic had not gotten to Tangier Island. This is a sign showing, telling about Fort Albion, the British fort that was there. Parson Joshua Thomas was a itinerant minister who traveled to Smith and Tangier Islands. And when the British were leaving there to go bombard Fort McHenry, they asked him to say a prayer for them. And interesting, the legend says that he did not, he would not offer a prayer for them. In fact, he said to them that what they're doing was unjust and immoral, and he predicted they would fail. Very interesting. He was right on that one. Smith Island, again, ancestors from Cornwall, three towns, Yule, Rhodes Point, and Tylertown. Today, most folks travel around on golf court carts. And of course, the Smith Island cake is the most famous thing 
from Smith Island. Cambridge, the Choptank Indians were there first, then the British came in 1684, it was named after Cambridge in England and known for its boat building and oysters. Harriet Tubman from the Civil War established a site there for, the under, for people coming from the South via the Underground Railroad. There's an interesting light, uh, uh, windmill outside of Cambridge. It's about a five mile drive. And I'd never heard of this before. We decided to explore it. It was quite interesting. Oxford, of course, we're all acquainted with. It goes back to 1683. <clears throat> Again, oysters and tobacco were exported to Europe. Robert Morris Jr. is from there. And he was a founding father who had lots of money and uh, spent a lot of it on the American Revolution. He was the only founder to sign the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. Unfortunately, he later went bankrupt. We're all acquainted with St. Michael's, another tobacco and oyster town. The British attacked there on August 10, 1813, but were not successful in burning down any of the uh, homes there. And now, of course, the famous inn at Perry's Cabin is a big attraction. Chestertown, established in 1706, was a prosperous seaport, second only to Annapolis, not era. <clears throat> Washington College was established there in 1782, the first college established in the States after the Revolution. Rock Hall and Fairley Creek. Um, Washington, Jefferson, and Madison would stop at Rock Hall because it was a transit between Annapolis and Philadelphia. At Fairley Creek, there was a skirmish in the uh, War of 1812 at a place called Cox Field. And this is a monument in the middle of these cornfields that I was able to find with plaques talking about the British who were killed and the Americans who were killed. And uh, this was, the British were defeated in this small skirmish. And this occurred two days before the bombardment of Fort McHenry. And the word quickly spread to Baltimore that it was possible to, to defeat the British in battle. So this kind of gave a boost to the American forces in Baltimore. Sir Peter Parker was the nephew of Lord Byron in England and he was killed at this battle. The Kitty Knight House George, in Georgetown, Maryland is a famous inn and restaurant. Um, Davis Jones said he, was, he had a dinner there a couple days ago. They, it was, the town was burned by Admiral George Coburn except the Kitty Knight House. She, Kitty Knight, was able to convince him not to burn the house, and it still sits there. Chesapeake City, Maryland, formerly Bohemia Village, goes back to 1661. Uh, in 1829, they, they built the Delaware, uh, the C&D Canal, uh, and it took them many years to get that completed. It was built by hand and by mules, and of course it was only about 50 feet wide. Now it's apparently the busiest uh, canal in the country with 15,000 vessels passing through there yearly. Poverty Grays, again, was attacked by the British. They really wreaked havoc up and down the bay during 1812. Um, it was originally named, known as Susquehanna Lower Ferry and renamed by Marquis de Lafayette in 18, 1785 when he came to visit his old haunts from the revolution. It was once under consideration by Congress to be the nation's capital and missed by one vote. When Admiral Cockburn burned the town in May of 1813, he marched about five miles north and, in, and destroyed an important iron foundry called Principio Furnace. This photograph here in the top is what's left of that uh, furnace, but they still have an ironworks there that was the last port of call. Uh, let's summarize our fascinating trip in the summer of 2020. And uh, again, we went through a lot of slides There's probably lots of information. Incidentally, there are many, many places that we did not visit. And um, it, I really thought about you know, going around and doing it again and visiting smaller ports, but it was a great experience. And I hope that you uh, learned a few things this evening and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Um. I only see one comment in the chat uh, with the reference to the uh, first uh, 
wireless speech. Uh, I think everybody can read that, that the waves were transmitted along the Neil Sound shore in front of the Vickers house between two masts, 50 feet high and one mile apart. Um, interesting technology. Um, I have a question. I'll start off. Uh, how long did this cruise take you? Well, it's a, it was a, uh, essentially it took eight weeks, but we divided it into two segments. We didn't do it all in, in one trip. So it could be done. I mean, it, obviously, if you spent, spent one night at each port, it would be 23 days. But Washington, you stay for four or five days. You stay in Annapolis for three days. You stay in Baltimore for three days. So people can make it as long or short as they want. But uh, the total time, I, I've forgotten the exact number of days we figured. It's probably 45 days, something like that. And I guess that would give you plenty of time to visit the places. Unfortunately, a lot of us come in and have dinner and leave the next morning. So uh, you're exactly right. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to try and stay longer at some of these places and learn more about the area. So, again, I think the Bay is just rich in history. This is just scratching the surface. Uh, we had a question in from Cheryl uh, about more of the technicalities. What is your boat's draft and what were the most challenging places to visit due to depth? <laughs> Well, the draft is uh, four feet, nine inches. And um, obviously it's a 61 foot motor yacht. So you don't want to be running aground. <laughs> and we made a concerted effort to be very careful about that. So we were, we actually had no problems. Uh, we were careful about where we tied up and, and uh, there were really no difficulties. Onancock is a very tiny town and, a, and there's, the marina there will really accommodate only boats up to 40 feet. They have about six to eight slips. So we had a tie up at the uh, main dock, which is just a long uh, pile, you know, uh, it's just a long straight strip. And we consumed the whole dock so nobody else could get in there. And, um, but there was plenty of water there. And that's, that's a fascinating little town. I, you know, I don't want to disparage it by, because they had several, there were some great restaurants there. We ate dinner at the hotel, the main hotel, which had a fabulous meal. There's some cute shops there. And they have a tradition there where people docking overnight, they, when you dock there, they'll give you a piece of paper with about 10 local names on it. And the locals will come to your boat, pick you up and take you to go shopping if you so need this, that service. And I've never been to a place that offered that before. So we, we really had no problems running aground or in shallow waters. And that, by the way, that's one of the reasons we did not take our boat to Smith Island and to Tangier Island. We specifically tied up in Crisfield and took the mail boats to those two islands because that can be hazardous. Well, according <laughs> to the, uh, uh, the tour boat captain that runs from Point Lookout to Smith Island, there's plenty of depth going in from the west, but you cannot continue on through the canal through Smith Island in anything deeper than like two or three feet. There you go. <laughs> so I, had I haven't done it myself, but I was right, I a, a passenger. I sailed there on a 30 foot sailboat that drew about four feet 40 years ago. My wife and I went there and uh, it really, this is to Smith Island, and it really has changed in that interval, I'll tell you, it's amazing. Uh, but there are not more people there, but there are more homes and they have golf carts. They didn't have, everybody was riding around on bicycles back then. So I think it's interesting to see if anybody has not been to either of those islands. I think you should, because I'm not sure how much longer they're going to be around. <laughs> oh, well, I'll throw in another question. Um, uh, it seems like as part of your cruise, you were able to get ashore and see some sites that weren't necessarily walking distance from the marina. Um, how did you get around? Uber. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever tried to get an Uber in Rock Hall? <laughs> no, in Rock Hall, we walked. <laughs> when I, <laughs> like uh, Hampton, we got an Uber. Uh, by the way, there's a great uh, nautical, uh, aeronautical museum in Hampton, Virginia. And if you ever go down there, you that should, again, this mentioned in my book, I couldn't cover everything in the book. But uh it's a wonderful uh, aeronautical museum down there. Um, so yeah, if you you know if you want to go a couple of miles, you get an Uber. That's all. <laughs> uh, question coming in, uh, I guess from Dave. Uh, can you dock at St. Clement's Island? No. 
you have to go there by land. There's really there's a tiny dock there with shallow water, and they have a little skiff that goes back and forth and takes people takes tourists back and forth to the island. Well, if anybody else has any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat or just uh, open up your microphone and, and share with us. Uh, if anybody, I hope nobody fell asleep. If anybody is interested in this book, it is available on Amazon, and um, you know, it was a it was a fun thing to write. I really enjoyed putting it together. And, and as I did research for the book, I learned a tremendous amount. There's so much history in this bay uh, that much bigger books could be written about it and have been written. Well, I just posted a link to the Amazon listing. I think. Um, oh, thank you. For anybody that's interested. And this is a unique group I'm speaking to because most of you have been to many of these places and are well acquainted with them. Sometimes I give presentations to people from out of state or you know, they're amateur boaters just getting into boating and they know nothing about the bay. So they're, they have a keener interest in the cruising part of it. That's why I sort of emphasize the history part of it tonight. Yeah, Michael, that uh, uh, picture you had of when you were in, I guess it was DC? Yes. Um, there was a boat in the foreground there. Uh, how long ago we, was that picture taken? Summer of 2020. 2020. Was that your boat? No, but I ran it for a while. Oh, is that uh, right? That was, that was uh, I, I believe it was a Lazara. Oh, okay. Uh, 76 foot. I don't know. I didn't get up that close to it. Yeah. So I, I, bought, I bought it up from uh, uh, Tampa. Hmm, nice. And then ran it for several, uh, about six months while I was here. Did you stay on it for a while at the Capitol Yacht Club? Uh, no, I didn't stay on it because I live in Fort Washington. Hmm. Oh, so yeah, yeah. even though the uh, the owner wanted me to, to stay on it, said, it doesn't make sense for me to stay on it. I, I, I live less than 20 minutes away, you yeah. know, in case something happened. So as a resident of the town of Fort Washington, have you been, you've been to the fort, I assume? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing fort. It's huge. I had no idea it was so big. Yeah, it's not that far. It takes about maybe 15 minutes to drive. When from I was, where I when we were, when we tied up at the Capitol Yacht Club, we were, I, of course, toured the piers and I learned from some neighbors that uh, Senator um, Mansion from West Virginia has a 70 foot yacht there that he lives on during the session. <laughs> Guess and the name. Sorry, at Fort Washington. Uh, no, it's at uh, Capitol Yacht Club. Capitol Yacht, Yacht, Club. Yacht Club. Yeah, so again, where say there's no way you can get up uh, Scataway Creek. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, uh, I'm saying when I was at the Capitol Yacht Club, I toured around the marina, and there gotcha. was a boat. It's a it's a 70 foot boat. He lives on that during the session. And, a, yeah. and last summer, they had some demonstrations. Some people were upset with him about something, and they demonstrated in kayaks around his boat. So I saw that. Exactly I'll, I'll, secret. I, I uh, run, uh, um, help run um, tour boats uh, out of uh, um, the wharf mm, there. Yeah. And uh, so I, I'm familiar with this boat okay. and uh, the demonstrations that took place right. at the time. Right. So it's actually public information. I'm not revealing any secrets here. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> you do know the name of his boat. I don't recall it now. It's almost heaven. There you go. Of course. Exactly. <laughs> kind of a giveaway. Exactly. Yeah, right. Mike Allen here. I just want to let you know, you know, over the years that I've been sailing on the Chesapeake Bay, I've gone to every single one of the locations that you, you know, you mentioned in the, in the book right. and on your talk, but I had absolutely no idea the history that you presented tonight. So I just find that absolutely fascinating and really appreciate the Appreciate what you've uh, what you told us about it. It's now I'm going to have to go read the book and find out all the rest of the stuff you didn't tell us about. Well, good. Well, I'm glad you learned something. What what one of one of the things that in going uh, that you did mention in going into the uh, in sailing into Baltimore, when you come underneath the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge, uh, going into Baltimore, if you look off to the right, there's a red, white, and blue buoy, the only one like it in the world. That's where the prison ship was anchored, where he uh, where he was actually observed what was going on and where he wrote the Star Spangled Banner. So it's always something I always like to point out to people. And that's my whole 
knowledge about the history of Baltimore so, is yeah. where that boom no, is located. <laughs> that's right. You're, you're correct about that. Although someone told me that it had been moved one time because it was in the way of some of the tug traffic and ship traffic. They moved it a few hundred yards somewhere. I don't know the details of that. But have you also noticed as you approach the key bridge, there's a flat uh, area of ground just to the right. Do you know what that is? Fort Carroll. Yeah, exactly. That was another fort to protect Baltimore. And of course, it's useless now. It's a bird sanctuary now. But do you by any chance to know some history about that? Like who built it? You'll never guess who built it. Robert E. Lee. He was, he was an engineer at the uh, West Point. And he built that fort and he built two forts outside of uh, Norfolk. And how the devil, he went from building forts to running the Confederate army. I'm not sure of that connection, but he was a very bright man, obviously, and understood tactics in the military. So, but that's, that's his creation right there at the key bridge. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And I hope to uh, see you all soon at, the, at a face-to-face -face meeting one time. You know, uh, that date is going to be uh, the 27th of November. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Great. I will try and make that meeting. I will be in town. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get you signed up. I'm glad you all could join us. Thank you so much. Well, and welcome back to Kafka. So, uh davis what do i do to get out of this do i hit sh stop yeah, if you go sharing. down and sh stop sharing screen it's up at the top okay got it there, there we go. go everybody now you can see us yeah <laughs> okay good well, well okay, thank then. um thank you all for um being with us tonight and i hope you'll join us next month um for our monthly meeting. Um, in the meantime, um, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel. So if you know anybody who didn't attend who would like to see it, please um, let them know. So we'll see you all by Zoom in October and in person in November. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, uh, Davis. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. And